Turn with me to Luke chapter 11, and if you'll stand, I want to read a few verses. Luke chapter 11, and I'm beginning in verse 5. Luke 11, verse 5. Jesus said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from with him, do not bother me, the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Father, we thank you for this word and as Jason has just prayed for those, Lord, who are facing persecution and suffering on your behalf, we, we just want you to know, Lord, that we care and that we would like you to let them know that there are those who are standing behind them. And because we realize that what is in the news is only the tip of the iceberg of what's going on behind the scenes. At the same time, Father, it makes our own sacrifices seem very small. And yet sometimes we really struggle with, can we make that sacrifice or not? Pray that you would, Lord, help this greater vision to help us know what's right and to do it for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for this day. Teach us from your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, let me mention before we start looking at this passage, uh, next week we will have a report from the uh, mission team. Most of them are back from Guatemala. I think all of them are back, actually, uh, from Guatemala. Uh, we're happy to see them. Saw some of them on the stage this morning, and uh, listening to the drummer, I, he, got, he got activated down there, it appears. So uh, we're glad to have them all back, and we'll look forward to hearing from them next week. So don't miss that. Uh, some wonderful times and some wonderful things that they have to share with us next Sunday morning. And now we're looking at this passage in Luke 11 as we're moving on in our study of prayer to the, to the last couple of sections here. Uh, got a baseball story for you this morning. This, this took place in the 1920s. Pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates named Danny McFadden had a 3-2 count on a batter when he threw what he thought was strike three. The umpire, Bill Clem, called it ball four. So as quickly as he could, McFadden was off the mound, coming toward home plate with his glasses in his hand. He handed them to the umpire and said, here, looks like you need these worse than I do. Well, Clem didn't take too kindly to that. And just as the manager, Frankie Frisch, was arriving on the scene, Clem was thumbing McFadden out of the game. And the manager said, well, wait, 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 Bill. Billy said, he's just a kid. He, 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 didn't really mean, he didn't really mean it. I mean, have a heart. And Clem said, well, listen, I'm not throwing him out of the game for insulting my eyesight. He said, I'm, I'm throwing out of the game for inciting the crowd. And at that, McFadden said, listen, I was not yelling at the grandstand. He said, I was yelling just in case your ears are as bad as your eyes. <laughs> <clears throat> makes me wonder this morning if some of us have stopped praying feeling that maybe the Lord is hard of hearing. Prayer seems to yield nothing. And so we've largely just kind of given up. I mean, it's really easy to do, right? I, I, I would suspect that we have all been there. But beloved, if that's where we are this morning, Jesus is urging us, get back in the prayer game. Or if you're in it, stay in it. Luke 11, 1 through 4, as we've looked at that, teaches us what to pray. In verses 5 through 13, he's going to tell us how to pray. And there are two words that govern those verses. One is persistence and the other is expectation. Pray persistently and pray expectantly. Verses five through eight that we look at today deal with persistently. The key verse is verse eight. 
I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, or the word could be translated persistence or shameless audacity, he will arise and give him whatever he needs. So how should we pray? Persistently. Now we're going to look at that word in a little more detail in a couple of weeks, but first I want us to get oriented on this uh, on this parable that the Lord gives here. In any parable, we, 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 we would first ask, well, what do the characters stand for, right? So here, the man who is asking for bread clearly stands for the disciples and by extension for all of us who would come to the Lord in prayer. Meanwhile, the sleepy homeowner, sleepy friend is representing God, so with that in mind, we have two questions to ask of this parable that I think are critical. The first question is, why is God reluctant? The second question is, why is persistence necessary? Why is God reluctant and why is persistence necessary? A.W. Tozier was a he was a great preacher in the Chicago area, the first part of the 20th century. Real devotional man of God. Uh, if you ever run across anything that he wrote, you want to get your hands on it and read it. But he, one of the statements he made one time is he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I mean, I think that is dead on, right? Because what we think about God, beloved, is going to inform everything we say, everything we do, every decision we take is going to reflect what we think about God. And if we think God is kind of decrepit or indifferent, uninterested, we're not going to be very incentivized to pray, right? But you say, well, isn't God the sleepy neighbor here? Didn't you just say that? Yes, we did. Note his response to the request. He will say from within, don't bother me. The door's shut. The kids are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Don't bother me. So God doesn't want to be bothered. So, the only alternative I have is to be the squeakiest wheel, right? To be the loudest and the longest and wear everybody else out so that I get, get God's attention and then maybe I can get a response. And you know, for most of us, it would be, that's just too hard. I, 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 I just, if, if that's what it's like, I don't want to go there and so we count ourselves out. If that's how we view God, we're not likely to spend a whole lot of time pursuing him, I think. So why does God not want to be bothered? Why is God reluctant? I want you to listen closely now because this is the heart of the message. Why is God reluctant? And the answer is, he's not. He's not reluctant. I mean, <laughs> that ought to be great news right there. God is not reluctant. This is not a parable of comparison like most parables are, where it's because this is like this, this is like this. This is a parable of contrast. It's one of, I think, only two that I can think of in the Bible. There's another one we're going to run into in Luke 18, but he's contrasting what God is not like. But I think Jesus does it for a specific reason here, which is that sometimes, even though he's not reluctant, it looks like he's reluctant, right? Right? Sometimes God appears reluctant. So Jesus is telling us, how do you deal with a God who seems not to be there? He's AWOL. He's, he's reluctant. And Jesus' answer is keep asking, persisting, audaciously. Keep coming. But before we go there and look at that in detail, I think it's important to ask, well, why, why God sometimes appears reluctant? You remember, if the most important thing about you, 
and about me is what we think of when we think about God, then this issue of reluctance could be really important, right? If we think he's reluctant, we're going to respond in kind. You know, if you think God is reluctant, you're going to blow him off just like you think he's blowing you off, right? Why would I spend time trying to get to know him and he's just not there? So it's important to understand why sometimes God seems reluctant when he's really not. If he's not reluctant, it changes everything. And I think we have to start with it from that point. God is not reluctant. But he seems reluctant. Why? A lot of reasons. Let me give you just four. Look at just four. Number one, unconfessed sin. Unconfessed sin. Number one on the list, really. Not only on this list, but in terms of its importance when it comes to prayer. Psalm 68, 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard it, if I cherish it, this is the literal meaning of the word there. If I have unconfessed sin in my heart, I simply will not give up. The Lord is not going to listen. How did, now listen, that was a sum. How did David know that? Personal experience. David had a lot of personal experience about harboring sin in his life that limited God. That's how he knew, and he realized as he wrote that psalm, that listen, if I'm out there harboring sin, it could be anything. You know, it could be anything from murder and anger and lasciviousness to something as simple as just my selfish nature, my desire for bitterness, my, for, for revenge, my bitterness, my harshness. Anything can be the thing that keeps God from being able to respond because I'm not being genuine with him. And he knows he knows our heart. So we can't very well be coming to God and ask him for help with my marriage, right, when I'm cheating on my income taxes, right? I can't be asking my friend for a loan when I'm stabbing him in the back. I mean, we all understand that, and God is operating on the same principle. Now listen, beloved, I know we won't be perfect. We are not perfect. But we must be daily and minute by minute, really, keeping short accounts with God, confessing what we know and trusting what he says in 1 John 1, 9 when he says, confess your sins and, I'll, and, and, and I will cleanse you from every sin. Confess what you know. Be keeping short accounts. But when we're doing that, we can be sure God is listening. But unconfessed sin keeps God from answering. Here's what he says in Matthew 5. He says, if you bring an offering, which would be equivalent to prayer, today, but you have unresolved conflict? It says in Matthew 5, 23, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. In other words, your gift is no good. Your prayer is no good. If you've got unresolved conflict, if you've got sin, if you're harboring ill will towards somebody in your heart, not going to work. God gets really personal about this in 1 Peter. You want to turn there? 1 Peter chapter 3. This is uh, particularly relevant to those of you who are married, but I think the principle applies across the board. 1 Peter chapter 3, look at it. 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. The Lord says this, he says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. Why? So that your prayers may not be hindered. You can't be on the outs with your husband or wife and expect that your prayers are going to be heard. It's an unconfessed sin. It's going somewhere that God will not go. And the principle is the same whether it's in a marriage relationship or somewhere else. If we've got unresolved conflict, if we have unconfessed sin in our life, beloved, God doesn't just appear reluctant. He is reluctant. Not because he wants to be. It's not his fault. It's our fault. We're not being clean with him. So unconfessed sin ties his hands. And the answer is what? Confess the sin. 
and forsake it. Second thing that makes God appear reluctant sometimes, spiritual warfare, spiritual warfare. Turn with me to Daniel 10. Daniel's just small enough that it's a little hard to find in the Old Testament, but if you get to Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Get to those big ones, you can get to Daniel. Daniel 10. I don't know what's going on with our sound. We thought we had this all figured out. We're getting a little static. Daniel 10. One day Daniel got a vision that he didn't understand. It plagued him. And he prayed for enlightenment. Didn't get anything. Nothing came. So for the next three weeks, he didn't eat. He didn't bathe. He just prayed. He spent his time doing everything he could to seek an answer. He was consumed with getting an answer. The vision was such that he thought, I've got to understand what this means. And so finally, after three weeks, 21 days, an angel finally shows up. And here's what the angel says, Daniel 10 and verse 12. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day, that's hardly reluctance, is it? From the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, from the first day your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia, which is a reference to a demon, an angel of Satan, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. But Michael, one of the chief princes, one of God's holy angels, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. I mean, that passage gives us amazing insight, does it not, into spiritual warfare, the reality of spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare isn't just something we talk about and it's kind of ethereal up here. It's actually going on. And in some way that we don't totally understand, good angels and demons battle it out in the background. And just like the answer to Daniel's prayer was delayed because of nothing Daniel had done, but because of the nature of the spiritual warfare that was going on, so the same kind of thing could happen to us because Paul is quickly re quick to remind us that we wrestle not in Ephesians 6, 12, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. We're in the same spiritual warfare that Daniel was in. So it could be spiritual warfare. Third thing that could be a cause for Seeming reluctance. The timing is wrong. The timing is wrong. Suppose your 10-year-old, assuming you have a 10-year-old, pretend you have a 10-year-old. Suppose your 10-year-old comes and asks you for the keys to the car. You're going to give them to him? I don't think so. You're not going to give those keys to a 10-year-old? Why? Because you don't love him? Be, 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 because you don't care about them, because you're indifferent to their transportation needs, because you want to deprive them? Of course not. It's none of those things, right? It's because you do love them that you're not going to give them the keys to the car, something that would be dangerous to them. It's a timing issue. He's not ready yet. The day will come when you will give them the keys to the car. And I know that causes a lot of fear and trauma, so we won't go there, but the day will come, right? Prayers like that, beloved. Sometimes God doesn't give us the things that we ask for because they would be harmful to us or to others, and we're just not smart enough to know that. We're not, his ways are not our ways, and his timing is not always our timing. Sometimes it's just a timing issue, and we, with our limited capacity, we don't know that. I still remember watching a ball game during the 1970s. Kurt Gowdy, you know, the, the, the game went extra innings. Kurt Gowdy was the announcer in those days on the network. And the, the game went extra innings, and then it went long, and then it went longer, until he finally made this announcement. I, I still can't say it. I got to read it. He said, the Tonight Show has been canceled. 
The tomorrow show will be seen later tonight, and the today show will be seen tomorrow. By the time he got done, my head was spinning. Right? I didn't know what day it was, let alone what time it was, let alone what day it was. He, our, our ability to, to have perspective is, is pretty limited. But God has no problem with that. God knows when the time is right. God knows what we don't know. I, I'm always reminded when I think about this, something Billy Graham's wife said one time, Ruth Bell Graham. She said, you know, if God answered every prayer of mine, I would have been married seven times to the wrong guy. I assume that somewhere along there, she, she thought God was pretty reluctant, right? He was saving the best for last. Could be a timing issue. Often is a timing issue. God's ways are not our ways. His timing is not our timing. Abraham prayed for 25 years for a son that God promised he was going to give to him. 25 years till he physically wasn't able to have children anymore. Paul prayed to have a troublesome thorn in the flesh removed. Did it happen? Yes. But it happened after he was glorified. Long time down the road. In the meantime, God was telling him, no, not time. I've got reasons for you to have that. Could be a timing issue. Fourth reason that God might appear reluctant. The answer is unrecognized. Sometimes the answer is there and we don't even see it. We don't, <laughs> it happened and we don't know it because it's not exactly what we were looking for. It's not exactly what we asked for. Thankfully, God didn't give us what we asked for. He gave us what we needed. And sometimes we don't see that until after the fact. And so it could be that what looks like a no or a maybe or a wait is actually here's what you really need. And sooner or later, maybe you'll see it. Lloyd Ogilvy. You know, was a pastor for many years. I think he, he became the chaplain in the Senate eventually, I think. But he was a pastor in Southern California. He, he used to tell of a businessman that was in his church, and this businessman was praying for a big deal to come in, right? He, it was important to his career. So he was praying that this order would come through, and instead it got canceled. It, it, it so took him down. He, he thought sure that God was going to answer this this prayer positively and it, and it so depressed him and his work began to suffer so much that he got fired. But then out of the firing, he began to start his own consulting company. And God blessed that. And it began to grow and he began to do well and it opened up new opportunities to represent Christ even in his secular calling. Wasn't the answer at all that he looked for. The answer came, but he would have never recognized it as the answer because it didn't look like what he thought it should be. See, we're just, we're just a little too anxious to help God out. We think we know what's best and really God knows what's best. Here's, here's the, here, the wrap-up to this, beloved. Here, the wrap-up is this. God is never reluctant, never. He's answering your prayers even as you're praying them. It's just that his timing is different and his ways are different than ours. And so here's what you hang on to. Psalm 84, 11. Psalm 84, 11. No good thing, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. What that saying is, that what looks like reluctance is actually love in action saving us from ourselves. Reluctance is love in action saving us from ourselves. But God is never reluctant. So that leads us to the second question from this passage, then, well, why is persistence necessary? Go back to Luke 11. Why is persistence necessary? If God's not reluctant, why is persistence necessary? Two reasons. The first is that we are responsible. We have a responsibility. So persistence is necessary. Look what he says in verse five, Luke 11, verse five. He says, and he said to them, which of you as a friend will go to him at midnight 
and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey. Now, why is this man at his neighbor's door? Because he's had a friend come, right? And his friend has come. He's arrived late at night. There's There are very few places to stay publicly in those days, and so people usually stayed with somebody. This guy has a friend, and he's arrived. He knocks on the door, and he wasn't expecting him, and there he is. And he's tired, and he's hungry. And the sort of the rules of the day, the rules of hospitality said you feed him, and you give him a place to stay. But he doesn't have any bread. They had enough for the day, and they were done, and there's no bread. But he's responsible. This guy's landed on his doorstep and by custom, he must respond or be negligent in his responsibility. Here's the question that brings to my mind. Who has arrived on our doorstep that we're responsible for? Who's arrived on our doorstep that we're responsible for? Is there anybody like that in your life? And the answer is yes, there is. God didn't just set us down in a wilderness, beloved, where we have no responsibility. What's the second part of the summation of the whole law? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbors yourself. That implies a huge responsibility. It, it, It may be that the need that's on our doorstep is a physical one. It may be that the need is an emotional one. It may be that the need is a spiritual one. It may be that all three are involved. But the point is, we're responsible. God has put somebody on our doorstep that we're responsible. We touch lives every day, and we will one day answer to God for how we did with that responsibility. We don't live in isolation. God doesn't intend that we live in isolation, but he intends as his his followers that we are, as we saw in Ephesians 1, we are his hands and feet to accomplish what he would do if he were here. Yes, we have responsibility. That should drive us to prayer. The realization that we have responsibility and responsibility before God for people that we live with. I don't know who it is. Somebody at your work, somebody at your school, somebody at church, somebody in your neighborhood, somebody in all the above. But we are responsible. Are we ducking our responsibility? You know, even a church, it's very possible. So all of you are going to be scared this morning. It's very possible for us to get with our own little clique of friends, right? And that's who we talk to instead of reaching out to who came new today. We have a responsibility. Somewhere, someone is depending on us to supply a need that God wants to supply through us. So we all have a mission to fulfill. See, and it's not primarily about us. I mean, if you want to know how bad we are about this, just think about your own prayer life. What does it consist of? Request after request after request about me. Is that the way yours is? That's that's the way mine is. Beloved, that's not the way Jesus has taught us to pray. We have a responsibility to those we are around. And that's where our prayers need to be going more than they are just toward ourselves and our own selfish needs. I, Chuck Swindoll told this story. You know, Chuck, he's on the radio, radio pastor and president of Dallas Seminary for years. He's getting old now. I, he's close to where our brother and sister live down in Texas. They tell me he kind of toddles to the pulpit now, but his messages are powerful. Chuck Swindoll, but he was in seminary down in Dallas years ago with his wife, and he was facing the immense financial, academic, family pressures because he was married at the time. And he said in the midst of this, they were told that the baby they were expecting was not probably going to live. He said, I needed a friend. I needed a friend. Said, so I went to the office of a professor that I particularly admired, a man I'd been studying under for almost four years at that time. He knocked on the door, no answer. But he could see there was a light under the door, so he thought there must be somebody there. He knocked again insistently until finally the door opened just a crack. The man opened the door and he said, yes, clearly perturbed. So 
Swindoll says, I stood there with tears running down my eyes. And I could, I could hear, I could, he, I could hear in his voice that he really didn't want to talk to me. And so I said, well, am I disturbing you? And the man said, yes, what do you want? Could that ever be us, beloved? Yes, what do you want? Chuck said, you know, nothing. I don't, I don't want anything. The man said, fine, shut the door. He said the next morning he ran into Howard Hendricks. I don't know how many of you have ever heard Howard Hendricks, but he's a treat. He was a professor there at the time. He's the guy that used to be with the Dallas Cowboys as their chaplain, uh, I guess one of his claims to fame, but he's a very outgoing, very bombastic personality, and he ran into Hendricks. And Hendricks took one look at him and said, man, what's wrong with you? He said, he poured out, I said, I poured out my heart to him, told him how we were worried about the baby. I said, I was even fearing for my wife's life. He said, Hendricks put his arm around me. He told me about the time that he and his wife had gone through a miscarriage that he had suffered. He prayed with me. He comforted me. He said, from that day forward, I wanted to know everything that that man, man knew because I knew he cared. Beloved, all around us, there are people like this that God has put in our path that we must be persisting in prayer about. Otherwise, we're like that professor number one who forgot why he was there in the first place. I think that's the question. Have we forgotten why we're here? We're not here just to be comfortable. We're not here just to plan our vacations. We're not here just to enjoy whatever little things we enjoy in the few moments between our work. We're here to love others. We have a responsibility. That should drive us to prayer. That's why we need to persist in prayer. Second reason we need to persist in prayer is that we are responsible, but we are also resourceless. We are resourceless on our own. Why did this man go to the neighbor's house in the middle of the night? Look at verse six. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing. I have nothing. If the sleepy neighbor is God and the one coming to get help is us, what's the point? I have nothing. You know, you think about loving others and you think about what's God going to ask me to do? What's God going to ask me to share physically, spiritually, emotionally? You know, you could be, it doesn't take long to realize, whoa, this is over my head. You know, your neighbor comes along and wants to talk about the divorce they're going through. Whoa, it's over my head. I want to talk about their kids and the priorities they need to set or that one that keeps going astray. Whoa, it's over my head. You feel inadequate. You feel resourceless. Guess what? Join the club. So do all of us. Because we are. That's why we need to come to the one who has the resources. Come to the Father. We must persist because we are resourceless. You know, one of the things, I think one of the most important things we need to learn about ministry is that God has put us here to serve others. In fact, God has even gifted us to serve others. He says as much. 1 Corinthians 12, 7, what does he say? To each of us has been given a manifestation of the Spirit, a spiritual gift. Why? For the common good, not for my good, for the common good. God has gifted me to minister. I've been born and reborn to accomplish a mission toward other people who are around me. That's who I am in Christ. But our giftedness is useless unless it's empowered by Him. It must be empowered by Him. I always think of the words that God gave to Zerubbabel when he was rebuilding the temple. You know, the people had been in captivity, Israelites had been in captivity, and they came back in the 500s AD and Zerubbabel comes on the scene and he is, he's, he's actually, he has the right to the throne. He's a descendant of David, but they weren't allowed to have kings. So he's their leader, he's their governor, and he comes on the scene. He's trying to rebuild the temple. 
10, 12 years go by and it doesn't get done. And finally, God comes to Zerubbabel one day and one of the things he says is this. He says, Zerubbabel, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel was a talented man. He was a man who had leadership skills. He had the gift of leadership. He had knowledge of construction. He had a mission but it wasn't getting accomplished until the Holy Spirit got involved. God was reminding Zerubbabel, listen, you need to pray so that eternal worth can be produced by an eternal God. No, you can't do it on your own, but I can do it. I can do it through you. I wanna do it through you. So in any ministry, beloved, we apply the gifts that God has given us, yes. We prepare, yes, but nothing of value happens until we've prayed the Holy Spirit into the equation, I promise you. Nothing of value will happen until we do that. I don't care whether it's teaching, whether it's helping, whether it's bringing the fellowship stuff or whatever. You say, you say that's, I can do that, that's easy. No, you can't. You can't bring food for fellowship and make it do what God wants it to do, which is to draw people's hearts together, right? You can't do that. But you can pray that God will do that. And you should be praying that God will do that. God has eternal purposes that he wants to accomplish through every move we make. We've got a persistent prayer. Major Ian Thomas, I, I heard him years ago when I was in college. He just died not that long ago. Old, old man by that time. He founded the Torchbearers in London. Some of you are aware of them. Some of you know Dick Mulhern, who was part of our congregation. Is, it was on their board. I don't know if he still is or not, but he was on their board of directors for many years, as is Brad Kearns, uh, Leela Kearns' son. But Ian Thomas founded the Torchbearers after World War II, and he tells how in his early days, he was, a, he was actually... Um, preaching in his early days to students at the university and to young people at church. But he said, even though it was clear that he had a gift of preaching for preaching and teaching, nothing was happening. Nobody was being converted. No signs that anything was going on. And he says that this, he said, the more I did, the less happened. And I became so deeply de depressed because I really loved the Lord with all my heart. So he was persisting in prayer about this one night. And he said, a verse came to my mind that I didn't even know that I knew it's Colossians 3, 4. Christ, who is your life? Just a small verse, just a few words. Christ, who is your life? And he realized what he was trying to do was give his life to Christ. And what Christ was trying to say is, no, 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 I want to live my life through you. You got this backwards. You're not doing for me. It's what I can do through you. And that's a whole different ball game. So he says, I prayed this way. He prayed in King James. In those days, everybody did. He says, thou art the one who are going to go out now, clothed with me, to do all that I so hopelessly have been trying to do in the past. He said, well now, Lord, thou art going to speak to that boys' class. Isn't it wonderful? Yesterday, I thought I was going to speak to those 90 boys, but today thou art going to do that. And he said that very day, and I'm sure the Lord was making a point, 30 of those boys made a decision to come to Christ as Savior. Because he was giving up the responsibility for the results and he was giving it to the Lord. He was persisting in prayer about it. He, he said this later on. He said he learned that all, listen to this now, all that God is, is available the man or woman who is available to all that God is. All that God is, is available to the man or woman who is available to all that God is. But how do we express that availability? Through prayer. Prayer is where we acknowledge, I can't do this, you're gonna have to do this. So far from saying, don't bother me, God is saying, I wanna live my life through you. That's what I wanna do. But I need you to open up. I need you to persist in prayer. 
I need to realize there are reasons it's not all going to happen the way you think it should happen. But you keep asking, you keep asking to the best of your knowledge, to the best of your ability to perceive. And while you're doing that, the Holy Spirit will be making intercession for you in accordance with my perfect will, and I will answer exactly that way. I'll tell you what, you persist in prayer, beloved, and sooner or later in his time, God will light up your life with results you never thought could happen. It's wonderful to see, it's wonderful to experience, it's wonderful to go through. I pray it for all of us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these reminders that far from being reluctant, you are right there. Just we don't understand your ways. We don't always perceive, sometimes we don't even see the answer when it's right there. Lord, I thank you that we have this assurance you will withhold no good thing from the one who walks uprightly. So help us to walk uprightly and help us to pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.